Okay, I think this might be a nice time to get started. Does that sound good? Okay. Hi all and welcome back. Uh, and for those new, I am um, and just joining us. I'm Dr. Meg Jackson Fox. I'm the Associate Curator of Academic and Public Programs at the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, and I will begin the day with the University of Arizona's land acknowledgement. This is a statement established in 2021 in consultation with leaders of the Tahana Autumn Nation and the Paskayaki tribe and with the university's Native American scholars. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona as on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. And I hope you will join us where you are in reflection and in action as we connect on native land. Echoing Dr. Kim's thanks yesterday at the symposium's beginnings, I want to extend our most sincere gratitude for the support through the 2022 Taiwan Spotlight Grant Program of the Taiwan Academy of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Los Angeles uh, and the overseas office. Um, this is their overseas office from the Ministry of Culture in Taiwan, and we thank them as well. Also from all of us at the Center for Creative Photography, we so appreciate Dr. Kim, the School of Art and Department of Art History and Arizona Arts for including the center in this really quite special and important convening. And uh, I know Dr. Kim just mentioned this for a moment, but for those of you who might've just tuned in, I'll note that you can choose your language that you'd like to hear by selecting the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can choose whether to have that interpretation be in English or in Chinese. So the agenda for the symposium today includes our first panel, Taiwanese Photography Then and Now. This panel will be followed by a special session entitled The Taiwanese Photography Magazine and Books, beginning at 7 p.m. Arizona and 10 a.m. Taipei. And now I'll introduce the first, um, the first panel chair and moderator, my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Ji Hae Kim. Dr. Kim's research encompasses the history of photography, visual culture, and film studies in East Asia. Kim is currently working on two book projects, Imagining Korea Through Photography on the History of Photography in Korea and Photography and Death, Funerary Photo Portraiture in East Asia. She also has been writing articles on vernacular photographic practices, as well as on um, the documentary films and visual culture in relationship to the Cold War and to gender politics in East Asia. As a curator, Kim has organized exhibitions such as the recent um, Poyoung Bookstore at Seoul Metropolitan Library, which presented North Korean artists of the 1950s and 60s. Kim earned her doctorate at the Graduate Center City University of New York, with a dissertation on funerary portrait photography in East Asia. She was the postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago, and of course has taken the lead and been the organizer for this symposium and our last on Korean photography. It's been a busy, bustling, humming spring and such a wonderful, um, important um, addition to the history of photography and, um, uh, and art history more largely. So Dr. Kim, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Meg. <laughs> well, this symposium cannot be realized with Meg's help as well. So my uh, great gratitude uh, to my colleague, Meg. Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to introduce our speakers. Uh, start, starting with our first speaker, Professor Paul Barclay. Uh, Paul Barclay uh, is professor and the head of history department at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. He is the general editor of the East Asia Image Collection that I shared yesterday on my, in, in my introduction. And he's the author of the book title, Outcasts of Empire, Japanese Rule on Taiwan's uh, quote-unquote Savage Water from 1874 to 1945, which was published by the University of California Press in 2018. He is currently researching Japanese military and police campaigns in Korea, China, Taiwan, and the Soviet Union from 1894 to 1934 for a project called Imperial Japan's Forever Wars. Please uh, join me to welcome Paul Barclay.
Well, thank you very much for that um, generous introduction. And I'm going to um, share the, the screen as, as we do. And I um, really feel very honored to be part of these panels. And I enjoyed last night's presentations, which were a little bit in intimidating because I don't know a lot about photography. But I'm going to try to make an argument with photographs in the 20 minutes that I have. And I'll, I'll start my timer so that um, maybe I can add something to this symposium um, and, and I'll do my best. And I'll tell you at the outset, I'm gonna be walking you through a lot of images. And after I do that, um, I will again, reinforce the argument that I think these images make. And so I think that, um, Thank you, Jihei, for already talking about the image collection. So I'll skip that and move right to the heart of my talk, which begins with the statuary and mnemonic landscape of, of contemporary Taiwan and battlefield memorials to indigenous wars against Japanese occupation. There's a memorial complex in Pingdong County uh, commemorating the 1874 Stone Gate battle. There's another famous one in Renai and Namto uh, about the Wusa or Musha uprising in 1930. And there's a, a lesser well-known one, but one that I, I photographed in 2015 near Dashi of the uh, Dhaka Khan um, battle of 1907. And um, these three memorial complexes depict indigenous peoples using machete swords, bows and arrows, and spears fighting against the modern Japanese imperial forces. Now, if we look at photographs from these three wars in 1874, there's not a lot of phot photography from that campaign, but there are some. And here's a couple of the more famous photographs, or we can look at photographs from the 1930 campaign, uh, the, the Musha suppressing the Musha uprising, or we could look at photographs from uh, Dashi circa 1907. And one thing that all of those photographs will have in common is that indigenous peoples carry firearms. And in fact, based on a doctoral dissertation um, written by uh, Lin Bei Shi, and this came out in 2016, I'm convinced that firearms were the traditional weapons of Taiwan indigenous peoples by 1900. That's the tradition. So the question that animates this paper is why do contemporary monuments to these wars get it so wrong. They are misrepresenting these wars as people with bows and arrows and spears against people with guns. And these were gun battles. All of them were gun battles. And my hypothesis, and I, I can't explain everything about the contemporary landscape of statuary, but, but one vector is to think about how colonial imagery disarmed the Taiwan indigenous peoples. And my argument is, is actually indigenous peoples in Taiwan were not disarmed in the 1910s, but the arms were put under the control of the government and selectively redistributed for the purpose of quelling counterinsurgencies to, to telegraph that argument. So I begin the written paper with a couple of 1913 articles in the Japanese press in colonial Taiwan, which is a sort of mouthpiece for the colonial government. And this headline to the left says that postcards of so-called savages are not going to be allowed to be sent to the home islands of Japan if they depict the themes of head hunting or skull shelves. And right next to that article on the same page is an announcement that Governor General Sakuma 
is going to hold an audience with 130 people from DACACON or the Galgan group. And as I argue in the paper, these two stories work together. One is about the figurative disarmament of indigenous peoples. We're going to ban a certain kind of imagery from circulation. And the other article is about actual disarmament because between 1910 and 1911, actually many of the people around the area known as Gaugan at the time, which is behind the mountains near Dashi, were physically disarmed. So in this paper, I'm playing with actual disarmament and figurative disarmament. And I investigated all of the picture postcards that I could locate in the Japanese archive. And one of the things that I have concluded is that this ban had some effect. It either caused or reflected a sea change in Japanese imagery. I cannot find any post-1918 Japanese postcards with this head-hunting imagery at all. So for whatever reason, that change in representational strategies changed in accord with the ban. And we can see that before 1913, when that ban was put in place, official Japanese photography that was used by the government to circulate a particular image of Taiwan included men with ammunition belts, large rifles, uh, decapitated heads, and different kinds of skull imagery. This was very common and promoted by the government before 1913 as their image of Taiwan to the outside world. Studio photography often featured portraits of men with firearms and ammo belts. And these are people that came to studios and generally they are people that were working with the Japanese government in some sort of capacity, usually to bring trade goods to themselves and um, to lend military muscle to, to various punitive campaigns. And these are, these are actually 1900 and prior photographs to, to the best of my knowledge. If we look at the two principal photography, photographers of indigenous imagery, Mori Ushinosuke and Segawa Kokichi, who worked in different time periods, on either side of this 1913 ban, we can find that for Mori's photograph album, the one that was used the most, we can find 114 photographs of indigenous males. Six of them have guns, but nine of them have skull shelves and explicit references to head hunting, and only five photos have spears or bows and arrows. By contrast, Segawa has about the same number of pictures of indigenous men, about the same number of pictures of men with guns, but there's no references to head hunting or soldiering. It's all specifically about game hunting. And there's many more photographs of men with spears and bows and arrows. So there's a Mori photograph here, which is a pre-1913 representational strategy. And then there's a Segawa picture. So, we can see actually that even photographs were doctored. Here's a 1913 photograph in black and white taken by Mori Ushinosuke. And here's a post 1930s postcard with the skull blacked out. So there's something going on here. We can look at this well circulated portrait of a man from uh, Chuchi, which is um, by today's Ulai. And we can see that this sort of exercise in top-down ethnogenesis. Here's the photograph. Here's the painting. There's no more weapon. You add some earrings, a more colorful shirt. This was done again in 1907. Here's the large weapon. Here's the disarmed man as the representative of a kinder, gentler Taiwan, etc. We can look at Ministry of Education geographies from 1903 to 1909. The figurehead of Taiwan to Japanese school children has this large uh, breech loading gun. But after 1910, there's no weaponry. And after 1919, there's a more domestic scene. 
And we can trace these photographs back to their origins. The first one that appeared in the Japanese textbook was taken in 1897, quite early, and it was reproduced by many publishers of textbooks and commercial books and official publications. And this other photograph taken by Mori in 1903 is used again in 1910. This is a widely circulated photograph, again, taken by Mori Ushinosuke. And these are pictures that present cultures without weapons. And we can see them again and again in these textbooks from 1919. Here's another set of 1903 photographs. Now, the power of captions in paratext shows that you can make these people back into dangerous figures if you caption them correctly. So here's an American newspaper from 1909 that takes these same figures and captions them differently as bellicose indigenous peoples who, who pose a kind of threat. But this imagery, it is only imagery of indigenous peoples. But one thing I want to stress in this presentation is I looked at every Japanese textbook that I could find published between 1897 and 1919, and I analyzed all of the photographs and etchings of Taiwanese people, and indigenous peoples are overrepresented by quite a bit considering the populations just in the raw numbers. Most pictures of Taiwan to the outside world in this picture were of indigenous peoples, at least in the different formats that I can quantitatively um, measure. So that gives, uh, I think, a little bit of added gravity. So before 1915, we can find commercial postcards of indigenous peoples with machine guns and field exercises being trained as soldiers. And in the post-1915 regime, we see men with spears and bows and arrows. So what story do these photographs tell? And I argue in the longer paper that the ascription of intra-indigenous violence to traditional cultural proclivities, this image of the former headhunter that commits violence for ritual purposes and has always done so, and is doing so to fight local enemies, people that have been enemies from the time before time, this fits into a Japanese discourse called using the barbarian to control the barbarian. And so in this visual narrative, which is backed by textual sources, Japanese colonial rule demilitarizes the indigenous territory. In other words, the Japanese press beginning in 1903, as far back as I can find, begins to adopt this phrase of using the barbarian or the savage to control the savage to describe this longstanding violence in Taiwan. And this gets picked up in the post-1980 world by scholars and journalists to describe a 1903 incident that I'll talk about quite briefly, a 1920 incident, and a 1930 incident for which we have photographic evidence of. So if we go to the Shimai Gahara incident of 1903, when Bunong men beheaded roughly 104 to 107 Tagadaya men with the encouragement of the Puli stationed Japanese constables, we have the, the first, here's a photographic picture of the head counting it's the Tagadaya people who are beheaded from Palan and Gungu or Hogo in Japanese, and the Bunong people are the beheaders. So this can be pictured as traditional warfare, using the barbarians to control the barbarians. The Slamao incident of 1920, again, photographs circulate of the beheaded and the beheaders. And you could say that Slamao people and Palan people were traditional enemies. But again, all of this warfare occurred at the behest of the government and in 1920 with weapons loaned to people by the government. And this famous photograph 
from 1930. It might be a 1931 photograph, actually. Over 6,800 irregular forces or indigenous men are employed to suppress this rebellion. And these allied indigenous fighters redeem 87 heads for bounties to the government. And they take 100 heads later at a POW camp known as the Second Musha Rebellion. So in this different story, when we look at the unpublished photographs of men with guns and not with spears and machetes, we can see a story of how Japanese colonial rule actually militarizes the indigenous territories through gun control. It does not demilitarize the indigenous territory. And the way this works is you give preferential treatment regarding access to firearms and ammunition and powder to secure allies in these counterinsurgency and punitive campaigns. That's a very different story about Japanese colonial rule, and it's a very different story about material culture and firearms. So that's, that's my presentation, and I, I very much appreciate your attention. Thank, thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> uh, we will have a Q&A session after uh, at, at the end of the session. So I hope the audience uh, could post uh, their question on Q&A box uh, whenever you have one. So our next speaker is uh, Mia Inxing Liu, uh, Associate Professor in the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California. She received her uh, PhD in art history from the University of Chicago in 2013. Her first book titled The Literati Lens, uh, One Run Landscape in Chinese Cinema from 1950 to 1979 was published in 2019 by the University of Hawaii Press, uh, which deals with uh, how landscape in feature cinema in Maoist China became fields of contesting visions. She also published on Chinese photography in the past few years. Her research interests focus on cinema, photography, optical devices, and other issues of media in the history of Chinese art and visual culture. Currently, she's working on a book manuscript on the intermediate dialogues between ink painting and photography in modern China. Mia, it's over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Ji and also thank you for the invitation uh, to be part of this wonderful conference and to uh, have this conversation with uh, all the scholars and colleagues from uh, Taiwan and uh, also uh, from everywhere in the world. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Zhang Zhaotang for um, providing uh, the images and a lot of information and um, insight and a lot of corrections uh, for my paper, which was published in 2019 under the same name. So I'm going to share the screen now. Okay. All right. So um, I would also like to add a little Chinese preamble <laughs> for the Chinese audiences here. Um, so, first, I Tuan Okay, so the talk today, however, will be in English. And thank you, special thank you for our interpreters today for your hard work and really appreciate it. Okay, so Zhang Zhaotang um, is 
one of the most important photographers in Taiwan. And some of his iconic pictures are regarded as landmarks in the history of Taiwanese photography. Zhang's career encompasses photography, film, television, poetry, and theater. He also does remarkable work as a historian of photography, a curator, and educator. Throughout his career as a photographer, however, his intense interest in surrealist art seems to have persisted till today. Indeed, in the retrospective exhibition titled Time, the images of Zhang Zhaotang, organized by the Taipei Fine Arts Museum in 2013, the recurring term used to describe his art is quote unquote surrealism. Surrealism in Zhang's photographs is manifest in headless silhouettes, masked men, massively proportioned bodies of animals and humans, often shown only in parts, and scenes resembling tableau out of the theater of the absurd. However, Zhang is also lauded as a forerunner for the nativist realist movement in Taiwanese photography, a movement that reached its heyday in the late 1970s and 1980s as a call for a return to the native soil of Taiwan and documenting Taiwan's contemporary social reality. Zhang was interested in photographing the little people in grassroots Taiwan. Also, as a photo historian, Zhang has been a trailblazer in chronicling Taiwan, Taiwan's documentary photographers and their works. His important book, In Search of Photos Past, in Xiang de Zhuixun, first published in 1988, right after the end of martial law, is a historical account of 33 of Taiwan's native documentary photographers from the 1940s to the 1960s. At the time, the official history of Taiwanese photography was largely written as merely an extension of salon photography carried over from China after 1949. Zhang wrote that the photographers he documents here, quote unquote, witnessed the difficult yet rich life and vitality among Taiwan's grassroots people. Therefore, for filling the long silent and enormous gap in the history of Taiwanese photography. With each photo, we have a chance to begin to collage Taiwan's past, present, and future, unquote. This was um, in his uh, preface in this book. Grouping these photographers together under the labels nativist and documentary, Zhang was aware that he was not only writing an alternative history of Taiwanese photography against the dominant institutions and against oblivion, against time, but also compiling the alternative history of modern Taiwan through photographic image, a native and therefore independent visual heritage around which Taiwan's future could rally. Many scholars in Taiwan have already written on the native, nativist movement in art and literature in response to the geopolitical shift in the 1970s. So my interest here in this talk is, in, is this question, how are we to understand this apparent pendulational swing on the level of the pictorial, meaning in calling Zhang Zhaotang's work both surrealist and documentary. Can nativist realist photography also be surreal and vice versa? If so, in what sense? How are we to understand Zhang's photography in relation to the discussion of modernist photography in the local context of Taiwan? So in this talk, I will address these questions through a close reading of a few of John's photographic works. I will especially focus on the temporal spatial syntax at work 
in his photos, which I identify as John's surrealist strategy, superimpositions. In 1962, John made the now famous headless self-portrait. John took this picture by strapping the camera on his neck and standing on the balcony as the sun cast his shadow on the truncated low wall, thus creating a quote unquote headless self-portrait. And you can see the landscape peeping um, behind and there's the tip of a tree here, uh, behind the wall here. It also became the first picture in a headless series, marking the beginning of his career as a modernist photographer. In 1965, together with Zheng Sangxi, he held an exhibition titled Modern Photography by Two Photographers. Now widely acclaimed to herald the coming of age of Taiwanese modernist photography and Taiwan's first photo exhibition to be labeled as modern in the title. John printed the, his headless self-portrait on the invitation card to this exhibition. John himself later described it as the beginning of an obsession with disintegration and transfiguration. And I quote a long quote of his own account here. Quote, ever since in 1962, I photographed myself as a headless silhouette. The disintegration between body and face and transfiguration became a, an obsession for me. In my pictures, I have faces powdered, masked, sometimes wrapped in plastic bags, and stiff, distorted, and maimed bodies. They look like they are falling, standing, or climbing as if rehearsing a play in the theater of the absurd." Unquote. And this was in his article, Beyond the Frame. John's headless portraits were especially impactful at a time when the overall culture in Taiwanese photography was dominated by salon aesthetics that championed archaic elegance and crafted pictorialism modeled after traditional Chinese painting. Um, if, I think uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Liao's uh, presentation uh, lecture yesterday to give us such an eloquent picture of um, that particular school of photography. In Zhang's photo, however, in this photo titled Xinzhu Wu Zhi Shan Taiwan, taken in 1963, we see a um, Man Ray like nude, nude back, uh, the backside of a nude. But Zhang's nude offers a lot more visual information and manifests a very different power compared to the staged. Um, photo in Man Ray and many of the other kind of dis staged distortion of Man Ray. John's own description of the process of making this particular photo is worth a careful reading here. Quote, at the time we climbed up, meaning we here, meaning Zhang Taotang and his artist friend Huang Yongsong featured here. At the time we climbed up to the top of the mountain and sat quietly facing the boundless vista. Since I had brought a camera, I thought I might as well take some pictures. But how do I encounter this vast and silent nature? I could think of no way of doing so except via a nude body. Huang Yongsong at my urging stripped himself naked without complaint. But what do I do with a nude body? I do not want a stiff nude like in a generic sketch or a generic sculpture. And I found the head and the limbs of the body all excessive and boring. I wanted a simple yet strange back like an, an urn. When he sat there, I also found the picture too balanced, 
So I decided he must lean sideways in order to create a rhythmic interchange with nature. Therefore, Yong Song arched his back and leaned to the side. I lowered my Aries Automat 120 camera as much as I could. As I pressed the shutter, both of us knew at the moment that we had finished a satisfactory work. At least it was something we had never seen before." Unquote. Some critics at the time contrasted this work with Lang Jingshan's work um, this one, and claimed Zhang's images were so modern and fresh that next to them, Lang, Lang Jingshan's works would become, quote, dusty antiques from the 18th century, unquote. Zhang's photos were unexpected and powerful because, for one thing, instead of portraying the nude body of a pretty female model, the usual, the usual practice among salon photography, Zhang took that of a male. For another, the man looked dead or even dismembered with only his torso remaining. In addition, the camera was positioned at such an unusually low angle that this torso seems so large that it was almost obscene. However, there are a few additional strategies at work in this photo. Oh, I have on the screen a, a sort of a contrast with some earlier new salon uh, nude photos to give you um, an idea of that comparison. There are a few additional strategies at work in this photo that need further examination. First of all, though the picture is certainly dominated by the sculptural male body in the front, it is also set in the out of doors, in nature, on top of a mountain, at a vantage point with a spectacular vista of mountains and seas extending to the horizon. Zhang himself noted that the impetus was to create a dialogue between the nude and nature. The atmospheric summer mountains in the background, even though largely blocked by the nude, are in fact very luminous and picturesque with a magnificent depth, not unlike the salon photography's favorite rhythmic landscapes like in Lan Jingshan's work. The critics remark that this picture set the salon pictures into an antiquated dustbin is correct in the sense that Zhang literally superimposed a pictorial, uh, superimposed on a pictorial landscape, an eerie sculptural nude. In addition, the photo is titled and noted by Zhang simply as Wu Zhi Shan Xin Zhu, Taiwan, 1962, stressing the indexical specificity. By spelling out the specific location and time in the title, Zhang's landscape is not an ahistorical fantasy of spiritual refuge, but a real place in Taiwan and a real time. In fact, the rock that Huang Yongsong, the sculptural subject here, was sitting on had some Chinese, had some carving here in um, Chinese, Chinese characters that can be made out to uh, be something like a Da Tong. Da Tong was here, perhaps. Um, the landscape in the background shimmers with the eternal beauty while the unsettling presence of an uncanny giant body commands the vista and transforms it into a surreality. The landscape is, it is temporarily and spatially real and noted as such in the title, defines the possibility of reading itself as well as the surreal sculpture on the rock as documentary commentary and critique against a specific social and local history in 1962. So we have two things going on here. Even though 
it was superimposed by the surrealist nude in the foreground. The settings in John's photos always seem to be specifically tagged with clear emphasis on the real time and space, sometimes with texts and signs in the picture itself. In this photo, for example, the man's face already superimposed with a sort of mask shot from the shoulders up, the man is also out of focus, is shown sticking out in front of the courtyard strewn with broken bicycles, discarded furniture and old junk. But there are two vertical signs among this rubble in shark, uh, in sharp focus in the background. One is in black with white characters and the other in white with black characters, like a couplet, telling us that among these shambles, somehow there is a everyday happy billiard, this one, and Tian Tian Le Zhuang Qiu Chang, as well as a always full pub, Without the man in the foreground, it is in itself an evocative scene of this sprawling reality of urbanizing Taiwan in the 1960s. But Zhang's photography creates a temporal and spatial possibility for both a surreality and an indexical presence of the real through this strategy of superimpositions. Superimposition also implies a syntax between at least two separate planes of images, and it highlights the fissures, blocking, and manipulation of depth and distance in between because of the spa spatial hierarchy implicit in superimposition that one image is imposed over the rest. It also suggests a hierarchical and transformative dynamic among the images within the picture. In another photo, we see a sculpture of an ape, again shot from its backside, looking over an ocean view on the seashore. But this is not just a picture of an ape by any sea. Zheng includes the English sign Pali Beach in the background to usher into the picture information about the exact location and time, thus giving it the potential function as documentary evidence of this area before its massive refurbishment in the past decades. Many of John's pictures work with a similar superimposition strategy between a sculptural subject over real natural scenes. In one of his early works titled Ban Chao, Taiwan, 1961, a naked plastic baby doll is seen hanging on a horizontal bar at a playground. As if seen through the child's eyes from a very low angle, the doll's strenuous aspiration to reach up and peer over the bar sculpted the doll, the doll also um, sculpted in light and in sharp focus in the foreground, appears as if stamped upon the background, which is a dense foliage of a large old tree that looks flat, almost decorative, both inviting and prohibiting at the same time. As Zhang comments on his intention when making this baby doll picture, quote, I needed a pure and unreadable perspective. So I made the doll naked and had him face the trees and sky. It's as if the baby doll is seeking his dreams and freedom. The tree and the sky beyond are visions mediated by the sculptural object, the doll. And through uh, superimposing the sculpted object, between the vision and the viewers, such a mediation, sorry, such a mediation itself 
also becomes the focus and thesis of the picture. Therefore, the image that is on the top of the others becomes the subject and subjectivity at the same time, commanding yet also blocking what is behind. Some note, oh, I think I want to go back to it. there. John note, quote, sculpture to most people looks ordinary. They're just plain old sculptures. But to me, the sculptures are alive while the people surrounding them are actually sculptures. Sculpture has the power to subjugate the people around it, unquote. This power is partly due to the medium of the sculpture itself. It is known to be intentionally made, finished, and self-contained, hence bringing to a photograph a self-contained presence apart from the rest of the photographic image. Another source of the power of the sculptural in the photograph also comes from the way John arranged the spatial relations. Sculpture in his photos are sharply sculpted with light and shadow in the fore. The angles are often either low or oblique to highlight the dominance of the sculptural object. In terms of temporality, sculptural time is also scheduled to be eternal, while modern shutter time remains instantaneous. John's photography then stages the tension through the superimposition of two different temporal orders. Sculpture is also still in its perpetual tension between resistance and propensity to movement. Like the stone lying in Forbidden City and the sculpture in a, this is um, a sculpture in a temple in Jiangxi who have been silent witnesses to history. A sculpture demarcates a silent and homogeneous temporality within in stark contrast to the clamoring fluid and transient in the human world around it. The diffuse heterogeneity in both the movements and the gazes of the bystanders, the sculpted object between the vision and the viewers, and those such a mediation itself also becomes the focus and the thesis of Zhang Zhaotang's picture. Therefore, the image that is on the top of the others becomes, um, I'm sorry, the, therefore, um, as Zhang notes, sorry, in other works by Zhang, sorry, I could have printed two pages. In other works by Zhang, there are objects that through John's framing become involuntary sculptural bodies. Parts of humans and animals transformed into an uncanny ambivalence between living and made objects, between subject and representation, and between animate and inanimate. In conclusion, in John's photography of superimposition, a single perspectival point is refuted and blocked, literally, by the excessive presence of the sculpturized body in the front. Yet the landscape behind the vast horizon that seemed to extend to the eternal void still pulls and recedes. So we have two tensions here. The landscape pulls back and the sculptural pushes forward. The streets and the mountains still exude their signifying message and power in spite of the massive blockage and superimposition of the objects in the front. Oftentimes, John rendered the foreground figure out of focus while the background settings remain sharply in focus. And he always titles his photos as simply a tag of the location where it was taken. So we have sort of a litany of these tags. 1962, Wu Zhishan, Xin Zhu, Xin Taipei, Wu Feng Township, or Peng Hu, and so forth. Therefore, such a superimposition of the sculptural object, the hallmark of surrealist photo language, 
over onto the natural also create a critical syntax of power as both its reference and its field and therefore a polity. Um, my final point, I mean, just quickly, system running out of time here. My final point, I also want to point out that Zhang projects this ghostly um, shadow of himself onto the real world in through through this strategy of superimposition and giving us a visual rebus with a dual signification field. But he's also always ready to forget and move away as soon as the rebus is seen. In one of his verses, he writes, his poem verses, he writes, a good for nothing person sees all these, then he forgets all these, unquote. In this sense, the distance between the tug of war, between the dual signification field in his photo is a space where he can move away as soon as the arrival to each is pronounced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> yeah, now I think now you could stop sharing. Well, uh, uh, for the audience, uh, you could uh, type your question on the Q&A box, uh, but uh, if we want to uh, address directly to one of the speakers, uh, I could allow you to talk at the end of the session. Uh, so uh, let's move to our next speaker. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Professor Joseph Allen. Uh, Joseph Allen is a professor emeritus of Chinese literature and cultural studies and the fine founding chair of the Department of Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Minnesota. His writings include those on classical and modern Chinese literature, history of translation and Taiwan studies, including aspects of vernacular photography in Taiwan. His book titled Taipei, City of Displacements, was published by the University of Washington Press in 2012, uh, which won the 2014 Levinson Prize in Chinese Studies Association for Asian Studies. Please. Uh, Welcome, Joseph. Uh, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for organizing this very interesting conference. I thank you and all the organizers. And I also want to thank the interpreters. I think this is a really nice thing to have here and it must be very hard work. And so I think just to reach out to them for, they're sort of invisible, but always there. So. Um, as Professor Kim mentioned, most of my work in Taiwan photography has been on vernacular photography, very vernacular photography. And so in this way, um, my work is very different than Professor Barclay and Professor Liu's work, which I found those papers very interesting. And I look forward to talking about them. This project began in the spring of 2000 um, when I was at the National Library in Taiwan, I happened to find they had a collection of uh, yearbooks, school yearbooks, middle school, uh, high school yearbooks. Um, and I became sort of fascinated with these almost meaningless photographs. And so um, I started the project then. And, but since then, of course, I've not been able to go back to Taiwan. And so um, the present some fairly straightforward uh, basic information and a reading of one photograph and maybe some other images. I hope to go back to Taiwan, particularly to the new uh, center of photography and see if I can pick this project up next year. So here I'm going to share my screen and begin the presentation. And for the interpreters, this part of the presentation is really the, basically the first five pages of the uh, essay that you received.
So the argument is often made that um, the conventions of early photography, particularly, were adopted and adapted from painting, from the pre-photographic painterly world. Yet there is one vernacular photographic genre that has very few precedents, if any, in the painterly world. And that's the institutional group portrait, most emblematically manifested in the school class photo. This is a genre so banal that it did not even make it onto Jeffrey Bakken's celebrated lengthy list of vernacular types. As an object considered, the class photo is almost without contingency or afterlife, nearly meaningless, lying at the furthest edge of the vernacular photographic realm. For a portraiture of individuals, the revolution in photography was toward the democratization of the genre. For the group portrait, the revolution was in its near ex nihilo invention by photography. This is in part because of the indexical nature of the photograph and the commemorative purpose of the genre. The purpose of the class photo is to establish the existence of the group to which individuals and educators belong. It is the group that is being commemorated, not the individual or not the event. The school photograph was democratic in its scope, but rigid in its formation. The school photograph contains the double presence of modernity, modern public education captured in the modern medium. This is especially true at the moment of the early 20th century when public education and the photographic technology became widely available. The institution of public education and the technology of photography was inter also intertwined with colonialism and the imperial project. Hearst and Spitzer argue that the technological innovations in photography and the development of public education coincided with two socio-political processes of colonization. Those two were the colonial project to integrate diverse peoples into the imperial state and two, to transfer and transform those groups into quote, similar versions of themselves, that is similar versions of the colonial rulers. But as Homi Baba put it, this is a mimicry in which the colonial subject is quote, almost but not quite the colonial ruler. Although considerations of Asian colonialism is far from the concern of Hertz and Spitzer, their description of the interplay between photography and the colony applies well, if not even better, to the post-1895 world of East Asia. When Japan took, excuse me, East Asia, <clears throat> when Japan took over the rule of Taiwan in 1895, photographic technology was already in its third generation. Moreover, public, ed public education in Japan had been following a German model for three decades. Thus, these two modern industries were primed to be imported into the colony where they would become increasingly interwoven, especially in the class photo. There were some pre-Japanese precedents for the formal group photo in Taiwan that foreshadowed the class photo, both in, pro in protocols, if not in ide ideology, such as this portrait of the Jiang family um, from the 1890s. The earliest actual class photograph in Taiwan may be this one at the George McKay's Oxford College dating from 1893. But in fact, this photo features more of the college's architecture than the students or the staff. In the early years of the colony, there were many portraits of Japanese military and civil officials, such as this one at the turn of the century with Governor General Kodama and his military leaders uh, arrayed in a classic 
group photograph. From this time, about this time, there's also this photograph, a uh, fine example of a more secular uh, occasional group portrait. These are members of the Taihoku Colonial Club on vacation. And at the very center with the uh, walking stick is Goto Shinpei. Today, the earliest known Japanese class photograph in Taiwan, at least that I've found, is a group portrait of what I assume is the 1910 graduating class of the Taihoku National Language School for Girls. This was an early Japanese language school established for teacher training of native students. These teacher teachers were trained for positions in the new common school, the Kogaku, uh, which were the elementary schools for the Taiwanese students. In this photograph, 45 dour looking young women stand dressed in a variety of traditional Chinese tunics and trousers, carefully arrayed in four rows, perhaps by some now lost rational order. That, that I know that there's some order to this is because the two young women standing on the sides are almost dressed exactly alike. Uh, and so sort of standing as sentinels, I'm assuming there were some sort of class leaders or something. The rest sit and stand at soft attention. In the front row, the students sit with folded hands in nearly perfect polite symmetry. All this represents the language of classroom, quote, obedience, as Hirsch and Spitzer speak. Any personal contingency or sign of disobedience seems erased by the institutional gaze of the school of the school photographer, no doubt one from one of the several photographic studios that populated the city at the time. Although lost to us, for the students in the photograph, as well for their family and friends, there would have been something very personal in this sea of faces. This is the nature of the group portrait, uniformity hiding the contingent. Those in and of the photograph would see friendship, personal struggles, and judgment. They would also see the passage of time, as well as a projection of the, their futures, girls becoming young women, teaching in and for the colonial enterprise. But we see only 45 blank faces, except for one. The young woman, fourth from the left in the second row, stares out at us grimly with a gauze patch over her left eye. For her graduation picture, this is particularly personal and particularly painful. There is in this a in the, there is in this a strong contingency that even we can see, a punctum, if not in her eye, then in ours. We have to wonder what happened, accident on the playground, tropical eye infection, or the optical stress of all those hours of study. But in her stare, there is a kind of disobedience, a disobedience that the institutional gaze desires to mask. It makes us want to know who she is and how this came to be. <clears throat> the students, <clears throat> The students' near uniformity, a hallmark of all class photos, is broken by the four adults, presumably teachers and staff, seated between rows one and two. The center couple appears to be the Japanese headmaster and his wife. He is in a standard colonial civil uniform, and she is in a kimono, kimono with her hair fashioned in, in a traditional shinong contrasting so sharply with the bangs and braids of the Chinese girls. On either side of the Japanese couple are what appears to be two Chinese adults or Taiwanese adults, an elderly woman on the right, perhaps the student's matron, and on the left, a young man, perhaps also in uniform, um, 
the dark school teacher's uniform is ubiquitous in later photos. He could be Japanese, but I suspect that he's their senior, a student senior from a similar school, sort of a class proctor perhaps. In her book, Listening to Images, Tina Camp asks us to look very carefully at such institutional but neglected photography to quote hear, to hear the mobility and resistance and expressiveness contained in what she calls the unlikely interplay between the vernacular and the state. Hirsch and Spitzer have taken up this mantle from Comte in their discussion of mid 20th century commemorative school photographs, especially from the Jewish ghetto in Europe and the Japanese internment camp in Japan, I mean, in the United States. Excuse me. Much of their listening, that's Hearst and Spitzer's listening, is concerned with reading of the contextual materials around the image and bringing those contextual materials to bear on the photograph itself. In that spirit, what is it that we can hear in this otherwise very, very quiet photo? First, of course, are the language spoken in the group. Although our photograph is somewhat decontextualized, we understand from the generic conventions that it commemorates the successful completion of a course of study of the national language, that is Japanese, the language of the colonizing power by these local young women. Yet, as the first generation of such students, presumably born around the time of the, the colony was formed, we also know that when they went home, that language of the success would have been translated into the local Minnan dialect. In this way, the young men, excuse me, the young women are, are early awkward embodiments of the double consciousness of the successful quote unquote colonial subject. They bear language of both the dominating and dominated cultures. Where we hear this most visually is in the sartorial dissonance of the photograph. The headmaster and mistress wearing the language of dominance and elitism. The students, despite their success at the national language, still marked as islanders <coughs> in dress, hair, and manner. They may aspire to the language of power, but it will always be accented by their local tongue. The two other adults in the photograph seem to hold an even more complicated speaking position. Given her age, the elderly matron on the right would presumably speak to her charges only in Taiwanese, entirely removed from the language of power. She, the woman, the matron, is for the girls a familiar figure. To her, the, to the woman, the Japanese authorities are incomprehensible aliens. And to them, the lady is a remainder of their colonizing project, always a fragment left undone. In contrast, the younger Chinese man on the left seems to represent the success of that project. <clears throat> Bilingual and charged with small responsibilities, including presumably translating between the matron and the headmaster. <clears throat> Unlike his younger charges, he is approaching the position of mimic man in the colonial structure. He has changed his clothes, he has changed his hair, he has changed his language, and maybe he has changed his mind. The photograph has one presence that is not only hard to hear, but even to see, being nearly only a shadow of someone. On the very far left of the third row, there is a figure obscured and only partly in frame. We can just make out the slope of broad shoulders and a large face in shadows, seemingly to feature a prominent nose. The figure stands a full head taller than all the others in the row and seems to wear a hat. 
it is an ominous, it is an ominous shadow, dark, silent, and unexplained. Perhaps it is the specter of world colonialism itself. So that's about the end of this more formal talk, but I just thought I'd show, since I have a few minutes left, just some later images to give you a sense of what the genre looks like as it, as it goes through time. This is a 1933, so this is after the, the uh, education reforms in the 20s. Uh, this is a, um, the opening pages of a, uh, uh, one of these yearbooks. This is the assembly of all the students in the morning um, facing the Japanese flag. This is a group of um, faculty. These would be primarily Taiwanese, even though at this point, this was also called a primary school. This was a school established in 1898 and was uh, a common school for Taiwanese students uh, in before the 1920s. And here's a page from this same yearbook. And what's interesting about these yearbooks as you go along, you get more contextualization uh, built into the yearbook, including a list of the students. Um, and these, judging by the names, these are primarily Taiwanese students. Um, and, and the teacher is Japanese, I believe. This cartouche, I'm assuming this is either, I mean, it's a, it's a student who wasn't there. And I assume it's did, not that you just missed class. I, I assume that he has uh, passed away He's, uh, in, bef from the last year. Uh, I, we see this in several, uh, in several of, the, uh, of the yearbooks. This is another school a little few years later. Now this was originally uh, a, a uh, primary school. So this is a Japanese oriented, Japanese dominated school. Uh, not all the teachers are Japanese. Uh, there are uh, Taiwanese in, in, in this group, uh, but um, they also perform this exact same sort of portraiture uh, themselves. And this is uh, one of the classes from there, uh, very uniformly uh, with the um, girls and boys in their boys in this military uniform, except this boy, it's very interesting. Um, and this military uniform is ubiquitous across the schools, while the girls' uniforms, as far as I can tell, are sort of school-specific. Um, uh, and then this is a, also from the same yearbook, a very different type of photograph, uh, class portrait around this uh, military um, artillery. And these boys uh, sort of hamming it up uh, and so sort of disrupting the uniformity uh, that you see so often uh, in these um, in these photographs. And then this is the um, just at the transition in 1946. Here's the children, and what's very interesting: these, these are the new Chinese teachers that came with the Republic, the people, uh, the Republic of China. Uh, KMT uh, teachers, and in the back row are the Japanese teachers. This is the Japanese headmaster uh, and the teachers. Uh, and so it's this sort of transitionary period uh, in, in 46. There's one girl that is right there. It's very interesting. She's sort of breaking ranks. She's got this big broad smile, which is of course not the not the standard protocol for photography, even at this point. Uh, most photography was, uh, was done with sort of serious expression. So I'm gonna stop sharing there and turn back to see you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alan. Yeah, we will have a Q&A session at the end. I also have questions. Yeah, thank you this, uh, for the speakers.
Uh, and so now uh, I'd like to open up Q&A session. So for the audience, if you have a question, uh, you could type your question on, uh, on Q&A box. And also uh, you could raise your hand. I could allow you to talk so that you could directly address your question to one of the speakers or to all the speakers. And uh, because we also have interpreters, two professional interpreters, you could, you could speak either in English or Chinese, uh, which language you prefer. So, uh, well, the first question is already posted by uh, Wendy Wang and, um, well, Paul answered briefly, uh, so, which is about uh, the images of indigenous children on those uh, uh, picture postcards and photographs Paul shows uh, in his presentation. So, Paul, do you want to uh, do you want to answer more or do you want to uh, add more to this question to the comment? Thank you for your question. Wendy, and I'll, I'll just be brief here. It seems to me, and, and this is a hypothesis, I like the question, that probably before 1910 or 20, there wasn't much of a line between childhood and adulthood in the depiction of marksmen. The, the idea would be that any indigenous person might use a gun. And I think it would be interesting to, to think about the intersection of the birth of, of childhood and adolescence as, as categories and a, a new kind of visual vocabulary. So I'm gonna take your question as a, as a challenge and, and as a new research um, question. And, and I can't give you a, a concrete answer, but I'm surprised I haven't thought more about that. So that's what makes these symposia so valuable. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, quite interesting to think of like um, the hierarchization of imperial citizen, uh, either as children or either as uh, mobilizable <laughs> future soldier probably there should be distinction between female and male and girls and boys as well. So it would be really, really interesting. Uh, but uh, before we move to the questions on the Q&A box, I, would like, uh, I will allow to talk uh, Wang Yai Lun so that you could directly address your question. Uh, Wang, you could unmute yourself and um, you could ask question. Maybe one is <laughs> away <laughs> from desk. Then uh, while Wang <laughs> is coming back, then I'll move to the uh, next question by uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, uh, I'm fascinated by the contrast of imagery between the disembodied heads and Buckley's, Dr. Buckley's presentation and the head, headless portraits in Dr. Liu's. Is there some connection that can be made between Dr. Lee's themes of documentary versus surreal and Dr. Barclay's of politics and visual culture, a reframing of history, or should we just be satisfied with happy visual coincidence cre created by the symposium's schedule? Well, I did not intend, but this is quite interesting comparison. And, and in my, I might add like, like because I'm all, always struggling uh, for uh, Korean and Taiwanese photography in the context of colonial legacy, like how the post-colonial Taiwanese and Korean photographers and artists, especially 50s and 60s and 70s, like uh, how much they were aware of uh, colonial legacy in their visual practice. So which might be related to this uh, question like could be coincidence but um like especially for Chang Chao Tang like how he was uh, aware of the Japanese uh colonialism and colonial legacy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I'm I'm not sure if we should be happy with the <laughs> with it as a pure coincidence but I guess I can offer maybe one thought on, on top of my head um of course And the headless body and the, dis, the partial view dismemberment of uh, surrealist 
photo overall um, from Europe to Latin America. And in this case, Zhang Zhang's photo obviously had that notion of violence in it, um, in the in a surrealist way of, you know, the Dadaist way of. Uh, responding to the absurdity of the war. Um, I'm not, I'm going to be very cautious from uh, shying away from claiming this is the sort of uh, representational, like a, a embodied representation of atrocity. That's not the entire picture either. Um, but for um, a lot of interpretation of Donald Hans work, um, there have been um, great writings, especially in um, Chinese, in Taiwanese scholarship on um, how it, his kind of existential um, angst Sickness, how he put around that the relation between uh, post kind of post the colonial but also shifting political um, anxiety of Taiwan um, in the midst of this you know the the shifting map uh, geopolitical map of Taiwan China Japan and the U S um, as well as the uh, generational kind of uh, coming of age being suppressed, uh, martial law and all that. So that's maybe something <laughs> uh, to make a connection between um, the, the possible, you know, the, the um, representation of violence in it. But um, I'm not satisfied with that uh, alone, obviously. And your question is interesting. Uh, and also on top of, uh, uh, Jihei's question about um, the presence of colonialism. Um, I'm sure you, I know that uh, Maya Luen, uh had a quite, who had a, the hand up. I was, I'm very eager to hear uh, Professor Wang's uh, opinion of uh, Chu because I learned a lot from uh, uh, her scholarship in um, Taiwanese photography. Maybe some of the audience can respond, but my, my research in uh, John Lalhan's work um, I haven't really done anything that I can kind of uh, pull off right, right away to answer that question in terms of a response to the Japanese colonialism. Maybe somebody else in the audience can, can speak to that much more eloquently than I can. Thank you. Yeah, because um, well, the, the, my comment or question to add the comment made by uh, anonymous attendee is because um, the, the Xiangtu, like native soil itself, was kind of very popular uh, theme or topic in the 1930s uh, throughout the Japanese empire. And I was quite uh, upheld and also fascinated for my own research to find its um, returning to East Asia in the 1970s, not just in Taiwan, but also in Korea and also in Japan. So there was some kind of very repetitive um, uh, trend of finding or even structuring uh, cultural essentialism during the colonial period and also post-colonial period of the 1970s, especially uh, it, it's also triggered by the detente period of uh, Cold War politics uh, in the 1970s. So, uh, well, I will briefly address this issue in my paper tomorrow, but um, I, have, uh, I have a question, uh, well, before we, we're still waiting for uh, Wang Yalun back <laughs> to uh, microphone, but um, uh, I have a question to Joseph. Um, are those uh, albums, are your uh, collection or, I, I see some of the like from Taiwan Memory uh, exhibition project and their, it's, it's project uh, probably, I think, uh, Academia Seneca, I, I assume, like, uh, but it, are, are those uh, albums from uh, your collection or from uh, elsewhere or, or what collection are you bringing uh, for those uh, school albums? Uh, and, and also like, uh, well, well, that also like very, very familiar protocol of uh, 
myself to like have to standing still in front of camera and I was one of the students who always refused to do so so like like even the the, the pose and the hierarchy among students and teachers which is pretty much like continuing uh these days as well so like like what what drew you to this uh, to this school album specifically? Well, to answer the first question, no, these were albums that were held either uh, either actually or digitally at the National Library in Taiwan. Uh, so they and um, I, as in most of my research, it just happened by accident. I just happened to. I was working on another project and I just happened to see him or find him. I can't remember exactly how. Um, and so it was a limited number and there was very limited contextualization for them, uh, but that's where it started. And I was, I actually had a grant to go back and do it in uh, 2021 and then 2022. And, and so I haven't been able to follow up. So I, I think, one of the problems with the paper is it's very limited in the much what it's dealing with. Um, but there is clearly, uh, this was clearly a, this is one genre that was uh, clearly photography invented. Um, very, very few uh, pre-photographic uh, group portraits exist. Um, Spitzer and, and Hirsch, Hirsch and Spitzer argue that there are, paintings of uh, groups of men such in guilds and things like that, that are sort of pre-photographic uh, antecedents, but this is a very weak antecedent to uh, this very, very powerful, uh, very ubiquitous uh, and, and very conventionalized photograph that takes over certainly not just Taiwan, but that's, uh, I think what's interesting perhaps in a colonial context. And I've talked about this in the paper about um, commercial photographs of businessmen is that uh, because of the racial ambiguities here, you really can't tell, particularly with children, I think, you really can't tell um, if this is a Taiwanese or, or Japanese child in these schools. And, before 2022, you would know because the schools were segregated, right? There was a dual track up until 1922. Uh, and, uh, but after 2022, when the schools were quote unquote opened, uh, even though they tended to be dominated in, by one group or other, uh, you can't really tell the difference. And the last photograph I showed, you know, next to the last photograph I showed, well, the two boys on top of the um, on top of the military artillery. Um, I can't tell. I have their names. They, they appear in the book, but I can't tell if they're Taiwanese boys or Japanese boys or or one of each. It's just an interesting sort of phenomenon. So in these, so this ambiguity, this you know uniformity, is even increased more in this in this context thank you well panelists are raising hands <laughs> so uh, i like uh ask uh chachi uh to ask uh to go first and then uh paul and then mia chachi you could unmute yourself and uh ask question Go 這些攝影素材呢
呃因素，就是因为战后台湾哦长期压抑了呃我们过去对日本殖民时期这一段历史的了解哦，所以在近来的这几十年当中，我觉得有一种类似像是一种补偿性的需要，就是透过这些老照片呢，提供了公众一种需求，那、呃、他们可以去理解那个。呃，日本殖民时期那些被遗忘的历史哦，呃，但是呃，近年来哦，就是从 a l l n 教授之前的研究呢，也让我们得到了一些启发哦。他从这些呃民间相片当中的服饰和身份上面的辨识呢，也反省了很多殖民主义的问题哦。那也给我们一些重新看这些材料的方法。不过，我想有一点好奇的是，想要询问的是说，那如果呢？从摄影史的角度，我们应该怎么样去面对这些大量的呃内容脉络哦、呃，可能已经消失的档案？那尤其我也知道，近来像是台湾呃有一些博物馆，他们其实也收藏了一些这些民间的毕业纪念册。那他们也都会面临到一些诠释上面的困难。那我们除了就是说，除了我们呃把照片哦当做一种历史证据的方法来看待之外，我想问的是说，那这这样子的这种呃毕业纪念册的研究或整理，我们有没有可能再去透过一种像是摄影风格或摆置方法，或者是刚刚呃金教授提到的，就是说像他们的姿态、一些类型上面的归纳去找到。到呃，可以去切入或探讨的角度呢？呃，或者是有没有可能从这里面看见摄影技术还有它物质性上面的变化？当然，这可能要透过一种也许更大庞大的整理工作。那这是我想要问这个 Alan 教授的问题。谢谢。Thank you very much.、Um... Yeah, I think this is a very interesting and and fraught area about vernacular photography.、Um, I feel, in some ways, sort of out of the picture, so to speak,、um, in the sense that、um, the vernacular photography that I've been able to access is really by accident. It hasn't been systematic at all.、Uh, I, I've come across these. I, one included a. I found a abandoned house, and it was family photographs. Thirty、uh, one、um, that just were just left in an abandoned house from the nineteen fifties,、um, and then things like this. These collections. I'm, I, I'm hoping, and I'm assuming that the Center for Photography in Taiwan is going to be the leading force. In bringing these materials into、um, into their collection and into the public, you know, view for us to use.、Um, one thing that I continue to do,、um, and I did a little bit tonight,、uh, is I I try to impose or superimpose, I guess, word should be tonight, superimpose a sort of creative nonfiction onto the Onto the photographs, and 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 try to bring some sort of humanity,、uh, not so much historical accuracy, but sort of you know、uh, humanity, or find some humanity or bring some humanity to these photographs. So that's the one thing I think I want to do. That is not a. I know they're indexical. I know they. They, they 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 trap something in a, in a certain time,、uh, and、uh, maybe sometimes we can find that. I mean, so we can reconstruct something.、Uh, particularly, I think people who are native to the to the、uh, to the country and to the to the island. But、um, my attempt, particularly these very very dead photographs, right? These you know, blank, almost blank photographs. I think it's a real, really interesting challenge to try to bring. Uh, creative humanity to these. So thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. Like I also like to add, like because I'm also working on vernacular photographs a lot. So like we, it's it's it's、um, almost impossible for us to identify who were the behind the camera, 
we have the images, those who are in front of camera. So like those are the actually clients of studio photography or even they hire studio photographer to come to their, their school to take those uh, yearbook photos. So, so we try to expand like these kind of studies of vernacular photograph as part of like visual culture and photographic culture, like, like the National Center of Photography and Images that is showing one Hua. So like photographic culture might be another very good uh, approach to these vernacular photographs, I think. Uh, we have Paul and Mia. So Paul, could you unmute yourself and ask questions? Well, well thank you again. Um... Joe, for being such a good teacher, I, I want to tell people at the symposium that Professor Allen wrote a remarkable article about Japanese photograph albums as well, um, where he took things that weren't very interesting to me, and he, he treated all of these photographs of troops marching across Taiwan, and he turned it into this really insightful analysis and he shared all of his data with me. I mean, this is the most unselfish scholar in the world. And a lot of my work is, is built on Joe's goodwill. And I, I, I stopped saying that at the beginning of my papers because I, it, it's, if I, but of course you don't know that at this symposium. And so my question is, for some reason, after the Japanese government got people to sever heads for its counterinsurgency, they posed for these memorial commemorative photographs that Joe writes so much about. So I want him to explain to me a little bit, and, and maybe not here, but I think that intersection between what I'm doing and is, is strong. Um, and I, I think it's interesting, and this is also a post-photographic kind of thing. And so I think there's an interrelationship between those two papers that, that could be explored. And of course, when I saw the papers of the 1960s and, and the television, I see every headless body as the work of a headhunter. And I think those connections are, are probably really hard to make. Um, but thanks for the questions and, and thanks Professor, for Professor Allen um, for, for long-term and, and short-term uh, provocations. Well, that's sort of embarrassing, but I, I appreciate it very much. I actually had, I had my hand raised and so maybe I had a question for Paul, uh, which is I think related. And Paul, as you know, in those photographic albums that showed the purge or the you know, sort of genocide starting around 1913. Um, I mean, these are very detailed albums. Uh, I mean, both gruesome and heroic. Um, every sort of, I mean, commemorative and occasional. I mean, there's an incredible rich vocabulary of photography in these albums. I always wondered, what was the intent? What was it? I mean, these are made by the Japanese military or Japanese government. And these are beautifully made albums. I always wondered what did they, what were they going, what was the purpose of those albums? Do you have any sense of that? So, as in terms of, in terms of colonial policy against the indigenous people or, or, or whatever? Very briefly, I, I think there had not, been acknowledged shooting wars um, after the Russo-Japanese War. And the military suppression of the righteous armies in Korea and the military suppression in Taiwan are these coterminous projects in counterinsurgency that keep Japan militarized. And it kind of primes the, the pump of violence and action. And I'm thinking of those, we need to do a lot more on the Korean Peninsula side of this and why there aren't more commemorative albums of that. But I think when those two counterinsurgencies are brought into better relationship with each other, we'll, we'll get better answers. But I, I, I do think 
that this this I do think that militarized populations are uh, need perpetual raw materials, and I look at it in that context. Um, and I'm I'm going to mute because other people who know a lot about pictures should talk. Uh, thank you, Joe. Okay. Yeah, because I also see the 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 police state, the establishment of police states throughout Japan. Japan Empire during the colonial period, like the Japanese police bureau also published their own uh, photo album in, in Korea in the 20s and 30s, especially their endeavor to expand the territory to Manchukuo. So, uh, well, this is really, really resourceful topic, but uh, let me uh, ask Mia to uh, unmute and ask us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess I have, um a comment, a kind of follow-up comment about 1960s headless pictures by, particularly since I worked on this particular case by Zhang Zhaotang. Um, I guess I want to kind of remind um, that uh, um, the, 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 the practice, the photo practice of modernist photographers like Zhang Zhaotang was not an insular kind of practice and it sure the colonialism the Japanese colonialism and the martial law the the, the hegemony of uh, the Chinese government um all that make uh, that's the condition that's the critical condition and the context of things but he was intensely injured in modernist photography, that's also part of history as well in the 1960s and 70s. So when he made his headless photos, he was in his account, he was saying that he was thinking about Henry Moore, he was thinking about Ray. So, so the explosion for people is also a huge part of pictures of comment. I actually have a question for Alan. Um, very, and also, um, I, I guess my question is why um, Su Huiyu, why did he choose Zhang Lao Tang? And why um, the, the key question that I think I'll just focus on this particular question is, um, so a lot of the things that, the kind of interesting things that you show today in the presentation seem to focus on um, the Tang Chao Qi Li Nan, the, the, the kind of B movie by Chiu Gang Jian, um, and where uh, Zhang Lahang was a cinematographer. Um, and I know uh, Zhang Lahang also made uh, photos during the shooting, uh, very uh, surrealist photos. I actually have a couple in my presentation, which is very different. So what I'm trying to ask you is that I, I think you show, you've shown that, um, of course, as a film scholar too, his, Zhang, Lahang's act, Zhang Lahang's work as a cinematographer uh, was a, a very important agency in the production of that that those films, but uh, where is the limit of his agency too? Uh, because for me, it's a little hard to kind of place his participation in those movies in his overall. Um, but I think it's also interesting. Um, not, not necessarily like uh, it's it's because it's hard to place, therefore shouldn't place. I'm just saying, um, how do you kind of reconcile or uh, how do you draw the line? Where is the limit of his, his agency vis-a-vis -vis Chou Ganjian's uh, agency in those movies? And how did uh, Su Hui respond to those limits? So I, I can't speak for Su Hui, but um, I think from, from our, um, from my conversation with him and also from his artist statement, I think the, the reason for him to be so interested in um, Zhang Zhaotang's portrait was because he was really more interested in that atmosphere that was captured through that photos, which is why he eventually made a film set basically of that photo. So, so for me as a film scholar, what was important and what was um, well more obvious for me was that construction of the atmosphere of that 
political climate at that time, which was really a imaginary imagination for for um, Su Hui, who was about uh, 40, early 40s, who has really no immediate experience of that, that time, that period of time. So that was really what I was also trying to say um, about that very heavy layer of imagination of that period of time where, where, um, where the knowledge of it and a lot of it was really only built and also restored after everything happened and way after it happened, right? And, um, and I agree with you that it is really hard to place and also think about Zhang Zhaotang's agency in these films specifically because even if he had everything on the celluloid, eventually the film went through um, editing and also went through censorship. So I did also find it very hard. Um, but what, what I was more interested in, and also I, I'm guessing Su Hui was also more interesting, it was those things that was left out. So, and that probably complicates um, the question about Zhang Zhaotang's agency, but we're um, through his, um, through Su Hui's work and also through my own writing, I think what we were both trying to do is to, again, insert our imagination and also try to rebuild um, that period, um, the time we never experienced from a later generation and also almost through a post-colonial kind of view or a decolonized point of view, depending on where you're sending from and looking at these projects. I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Well, I also had a question, I mean, a lot of questions actually for uh, all of the speakers, like, because I also do see the the sort of like the popularity of uh, erotic movies or pornographic movies of the 80s uh, was also sim very similar in South Korea at the time, but but it was totally forgotten afterward. But as way you try to uh, reinvite the period and his uh, reenacting those uh, scenes of Chang Dao Tang's films and others was quite uh, fascinating. But at the same time, like I was uh, wondering like the feminist scholarship of the 1980s versus uh, 21st century as well. Well, but I should stop because we're a, a little <laughs> behind the schedule and the move to to our uh, last uh, session of today, uh, which uh, where we invite uh, two wonderful uh, photography magazine publishers uh, in Taipei. And uh, thankfully, Dr. Liu uh, will moderate the session. Well, it's very busy day for her. I'm really, really grateful that she accepts uh, my invitation, my, my invitation uh, to this uh, event. And please, uh, Dr. Liu, uh, welcome, um, to, uh, welcome the two speakers for the session. Uh, you should unmute yourself. Yeah, hold on a second. Uh, <laughs> let me uh, um, pull it up first. Shall we take a two minutes sure. water break? Sure, sure. <laughs> like uh, in, the, in the meantime, I also like you uh, like uh, uh, remind the audience whenever you have a question, you could always type your question on the Q&A box uh, throughout, uh, throughout the panel and set every session. And also you could, uh, we have uh, interpretation function for this event. So you could always uh, uh, choose a uh, language you prefer to listen. Um, in either in English or in Chinese. So um, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our uh, two invited uh, speakers for the uh, for this panel, uh, Wei Yi Li and uh, Liang Ping Zhao from Taipei. Uh, good morning <laughs> again uh, to uh, Liang Ping and um, Wei Yi. So uh, uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Wei Yi Li first. Uh, uh, and I'm going to introduce Wei Yi first. 
So Wei Yi Li is the founder and publisher of Voices of Photography magazine, which I really, really admire. And I also uh, order the magazine to all the way to Arizona <laughs> whenever I found the, the specific issues of really uh, interesting. Uh, Wei Yi Li publishes Voices of Photography, an independent publication dedicated to image culture, which he helms as the chief editor. He engages in writing, design, and editing, and also publishes books focusing on the cultural and historical diversity in photography. He has obtained several awards at the Golden Tripod Award, the highest honor in Taiwan's publishing industry. He has also participated in the planning and judging of forums, workshops, and exhibitions related to visual arts in Taiwan and internationally. Uh, well, he's based in Taipei. So uh, please uh, join me to welcome Wei Yi. Uh, yes, yes, we could hear you well. Oh, uh, I'm You could uh, share your screen. No, we don't see your screen. Yeah, now we see. Now oh. we see. Okay, oh, thank you. Hello, I'm Li Wei Yi. Well, I'm very happy to be here at the University of Arizona School of Visual Arts and Culture to be here to share my presentation with you all. Thank you very much for the host. Because time is not very short, I will try to speak as fast as possible. 嗯，不完整的地方，请大家见谅。那我是在二零一一年创立呃影研社，那、呃、开始发行一份关注呃视觉文化和历史的影像文化刊物《摄影之声》。那同时我也出版一些呃跟摄影论述相关的丛书。那我独立从事这个呃写作、编辑、设计、策划嗯的这些出版工作，到目前有十年的时间。那我的编辑与出版的方针，主要是从我对摄影的关注面向出发。那其中包括了对于摄影和视觉感知在文化、艺术、历史还有媒介论题上的探索。那我希望可以后设的去思考摄影，呃，以及尝试在现现存的这个视觉经验还有摄影的这个既有的认识体系里面，呃，重新思索摄影。摄影之于我啊，乃至于之于台湾的意义和可能性。那呃，虽然作为一个这个和摄影有非常密切关联的这个出版人，但是我的目的并不是推广摄影啊，而是对摄影保持质疑啊，重新将这个摄影加上引号。呃，可能这个是因为我对摄影仍然这个充满疑问的缘故。例如，我对摄影啊，跟我们的、跟我们的关系，以及跟台湾之间的关系，呃，是如何产生关联的，我仍然充满了疑惑。那我也想知道，我们可以如何介入摄影的意涵啊？可以如何产生对于摄影在论认识论上面的呃参与度和话语权？那因为这样的好奇，也成为
呃，我在这个出版和编辑工作上比较核心的问题意识。呃，接下来我会概略的介绍一下摄影之声和我的工作。那从呃二零一一年创刊起，那摄影之声目前出版了三十一期。呃，每一期都有一个主题，那内容是主要围绕当期主题进行探讨。那就像我前面提及的，每一期的专题的发想是从文化、艺术、历史、媒介的等等的角度出发。那过去曾经策划的这个主题包括呃暴力、呃记忆、反叛、身体与性、呃影像档案、呃家族雕塑、呃监控等等。那近期出版的最新期是《技术逻辑》，呃，这每一期的摄影之声会因为这个主题的不同而有一点不不太一样。那其中主要的单元包括了，例如介绍艺术家作品啊，收录艺术家的创作文献，那是一种呃纸上策展的方式呈现出来。那同时也透过这个跟艺术家的访谈对话。那进行关于呃视觉命题啊，和这个创作上的讨论。那我们的呃访问也包括了世界各地的影像文化工作者，像是出版人、策展人、艺术机构、编辑与设呃设计师等等。那从这样子的对话中，试图勾勒出当代影像文化的面貌。那除此之外，我也策划一些研究型的专题。那大部分是和台湾的历史以及文化的发展相关。那这些专题，呃，也是就是考觉台湾影像档案和文献资料比较深入的制作，呃，同时也邀请学者与研究者共同参与撰述。那曾经出版的包括刚看到的日本时代的台湾写真帖特辑，啊、呃，抗议行动与影像，呃，冷战影像，美国因素。呃，被摄影史，成为影像的台湾，呃，以及一些跟冷战时期相关的，包括美元视觉性、农夫会影像专题。那我希望借由梳理一些台湾的档案文献，啊、呃，推进摄影和摄呃视觉文化的论述、书写还有研究，来拓展呃我们在影像论语的范围。那，呃，我同时也关心台湾的这个影像阅读、书写还有出版文化，所以在创刊的时候就有设立呃摄影书的介绍和评论单元，那也持续持续的引介独立出版和个人出版品，那制作了一些摄影书还有摄影书摄影书文化的这个摄影出版文化的一些专题，那像是台湾摄影书特辑。然后，摄影书作为方法的系列，以及影像刊制考，那希望这样可以带动影像阅读的风气，以及对于摄影出版的重视。那除此之外，摄影之声也设有这个影像与摄影史的栏目，呃，持续推动摄影的论述书写。呃，我同时也制作一些艺术家专号，嗯、呃。就整本杂志的篇幅来介绍一位艺术家的创作生涯啊，记录他们的这个创作手稿和文献，呃，同时也进行深度的访谈和评论。然后曾经出版的包括张兆堂专号啊，还有这个高崇礼专号。嗯、呃，同时我也策划了一个叫做“亚洲当代摄影文化现场”的专题系列。那这是和呃亚洲各地的影像研究者、策展人、艺术家还有文化工作者一起合作参与的这个企划编制。那我的目的是透过这个亚细连接和在地的视野，来拓展我们对于摄影在亚洲的呃实践历程啊、呃这个视觉经验啊，还有文化的认识。
。那目前我们从东亚开始，已经制作了这个韩国专题，还有这个冲绳专题。那我们现在看到的是韩国专题。那这是重整专题。好，那除了摄影之声以外，我也不定期会制作一份叫做 Shots 的 Zing。那怎么会说它是 Zing 呢？是因为它原本是因为好玩来制作的。那它本来是这个摄影之声的一些夹页或者是别册，那形式和内容都不是很固定。那有有的时候是我自己搜集的一些影像档案，那有的时候是这种纸上电影，啊，有的时候是艺术家的这个小集册，啊，作品的小集册。那后来少的特辑就发展成一个独立的出版品，呃，用来介绍这个新进的影像创作者，然后每一集的这个设计呈现都不太一样。那这个少的特辑，呃，第一次发行是这个二零一五年，然后用四册合集来介绍台湾、日本、韩国、中国的十六位年轻艺术家，然后也邀请各地的评论者来撰写这个当地的当代摄影的现况和发展。然后二零一六二零一六年的这个特辑是。将这个四位台湾艺术家的作品合在一起，然后用不同的尺寸的纸张，然后复合的折页方式，还有粘贴的方式来手工随机排列影像的顺序啊，进行装帧。那读者需要自己把每张照片这样的撕下来，一一展开才能够看到照片。给大家一个概念，下一个，哦，就是二零一七年的，然后啊，这是二零一九年，这就是集结了三个台湾艺术家的创作，对不起。然后同样是用不同的装帧方式来呈现影像，那是希望透过就是各种影像编辑的这个方法与尝试来呃呈现影像，那这也是制作这个系列有趣的地方。OK， 呃，除了这个刚刚提到的摄影之声，还有 Shots 特辑以外，那我现在开始出版这个影像论述书籍，嗯，其中包括了影像理论、摄影史、艺术家文集，还有一些译丛。呃，作为台湾少数专注于这个影像文化还有摄影论语的这个独立出版单位，就是希望这样子慢慢的可以。为摄影的出版和思考带来一些多样性。那我的报告先到这边，谢谢。啊、uh, ，Thank you so much， 啊、uh, ，韦丽。Uh, to introduce、uh, the magazine, the, the Voices of Photography, and also、uh, the various projects that uh, you and the, uh, the magazine、uh, have been leading. So let me introduce、uh, our next speaker, Liang Pinzhao.、Uh, Liang Pinzhao is an artist、uh, and the founder of Lightbox Photo Library based in Taipei, Taiwan. He holds an <clears throat> MFA degree from Pratt Institute, and he is the recipient of Fulbright Grant, uh, Fulbright Grant and New York Residency Program sponsored Sponsored by the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan and Paris Photography Exchange Program, sponsored by French Office in Taipei, among others. 
Additionally, he devotes himself to public services, art education, and open culture. He is one of the advisory committee members of National Center of Photography and Images, an adjunct assistant professor at National Changchi University, and the director of Lightbox Photo Library, a shared social infrastructure for Taiwanese photography community. Uh, Liang Pihin, it's over to you. All right. Uh... I think I'll first share my screen. Uh, can you can you see the um, my uh, the projection? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, I'll I'll begin with English, but when it comes to the content, I'll be I'll switch back to the Mandarin. Uh, hello, everyone. Good local time. Uh, my name is Taoyang Bing, and it's an honor to participate in the symposium. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you. Professor Kings and uh, interpreter for uh, making this uh, a wonderful event. Uh, my topic today is co-creating an open photography culture, the project and purpose of Lightbox Photo Library. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking in Mandarin uh, from now on. And before I begin, uh, just a quick comments on Wei's uh, presentation. That's probably one of the most beautiful uh, presentation, <laughs> visually, aesthetically, uh, I've ever seen for, for a long time. So. Thank you. Um, it's it's beautiful. And okay. Uh, 这是我今天的专家的大纲。那我接下来会依据简介，就是Lightbox，然后以及我们在二零一九年的一个全部计划，然后还有呃比较后设的去思考呃图书馆作为方法什么意思。那另外就是我们做的一些计划，当然摄影
然后一年大概可以接待三千五百个人，那一半来看书，一半来参加活动。那现在我们搬到比较大的地方，那我们大概可以服务的社群大概人会变得比较多。那这是我们 Live 新空间的一个图，呃，一个 floor plan， 一个图面。那你可以看得到它跟过去比起来，以前我们在一个三楼，那有些时候对有些有些活动对有些人来讲是不方便的。那当我们有机会申请到一个新的空间的时候，我们我们希望让那个 free to all 的概念不只是 able body， 就是你你是一般人可以进去。我们考量到一些像是高龄高龄者、儿童或轮椅使用者，那如何让他们也能够轻松的入馆？那另外，我们也会在讲座活动的时候会收到一些听语这样的朋友，他说他想来参加，那我们就去申请收语翻译。的服务，让更多人可以共同的参与，把这个 free to all 的概念再稍微扩大一点点。那接下来就是，让我简单的带很很很快的大家看一下当时我们做的群众募资的集集资的计划，就是回顾一些照片，那来说明一下这个所谓社群共建到底什么意思。那这是我们当时提出来的一个，我来宝现在。所在的地方其实原本是台北市政府的一个闲置的公共空间，然而能够从一个室友的闲置空间到成为一个开放公众去申请活化的政策，其实要归功背后的推动者其实是 G 零 V 的社群。那由于这个地点很好，就是我们当时这个工签当时有十六个单位申请，那我们很幸运申请到之后就面临到一个挑战，就是那个很高额的修缮的工程费用。那我们就是一个小组织，没有钱，没有资源。那我们当时就是放下手边所有的工作，然后全力投入呃群众集资计划，一边修缮，然后一边募款。嗯，回想起来有点恐怖，但就是呃，也就是工程款要一直交。然后，然后给大家看一下这个空间，这是我们当时的一个在这个旧的空新的空间呃要要修缮前的一个合照。大家当时还笑得比较开心，但真的投入群众集资计划的时候非常辛苦。然后这是一些工程的过程，你可以看到这是一个空间的清运的作业，然后后来就是拆除的作业。然后这是大概是泥作跟铁工，然后还有一些木作。那这个空间修缮前后大概花了半年的时间，那最后是在二零一五年的时候落成啊，正式对外开放。那当然，这一切真的要感谢过程中很多帮助，给 Livebox 帮助的朋友。其实很多人都今天在线上，那因为谢谢你们。那当时大概有超过七百个人的七百人次的捐款，然后我们一共募集到三百二十万元。呃，不过我们其实还差了一百万，所以就是，但 anyway， 我们完成了这个工程。然后，呃，另外我想谈一下，就是摄影，呃，图书馆作为方法这个这件事情，其实有两个意思了。就是成立图书馆，我们觉得除了对于啊、呃、改善环境有可以带来一点点正向的帮助之外，那另外我觉得就是我们从呃图书的图书馆做的这个图书分类法这件事情，我们也可以来描绘台湾摄影的形构，跟就是我们可以看到摄影在台湾的发展样态，就是。每个图书馆都会有他自己对于摄影的分类方法。那这个东西，当然我们可以提出从台湾出发的思考，因为我们主要关注的是台湾。那提出一个从台湾思考的分类方法，呃，我我觉得是一个重要的意义。虽然它好像比较是幕后的工作。那我们目前的分类方式大概是这样子，这大概我印象中这个大概是我们第三次的修订跟调整。那每一次讨论，其实都会有一些图资、摄影跟艺术专业的工作伙伴参与讨论。那总的来说，有所谓的摄影集、摄影史论、艺术与文化研究、摄影技术与器材、期刊年鉴跟展览图录。当然，就是我们在呃那个讨论我们的分类方式的时候，其实我们参考了不少的呃其他的分类法，就是台湾呃在。博物馆社群当中最广泛使用的中文图书分类法，那摄影在这这这个分类法里面被归类在艺术类，然后它是跟呃电脑艺术合并在一起的。但大体而言，如果你整个看过，嗯，摄影虽然被分类在所谓的艺术类，但实际上是以器材、技术、应用性质的书居多。那另外还有一些摄影相关的书籍，可能
分被分散在其他的类目上面，例如电影摄影、测量摄影，或者是书画、建筑的图集，那他们会被分类在不同的地方。那另外，我们也参考了日本的分类法、实境分类法。那在日本，他们其实也是把摄影分类在艺术艺术里面，它的分类号是 740， 但它其实非常分散。很多的摄影出版物其实分散在其他的不同的类目，跟台湾不太一样。那另外，根据我们也参考了美国国会图书馆的分类法，那它基本上是被放在科技类。另外一个，在美国常见的分类法是杜威分类，杜威分类法，那它也是放在呃艺术类，那分类号大概是七七零。那值得一提的是，就是虽然我们没有参考中国图书馆的分类法，但就是我们。有稍微做，就是稍微看了一下，就是呃，就值得一提的是，中国在摄影艺术理论的分类上，一共有九项，分得蛮细的。我我我猜想了，这是我的臆测，可能是他们有很多人在做一些翻译出版，可能跟这个有点关系，但我只是我的臆测。那附带一提的是，就是刚才威仪在呃说到，就是关于关于摄影书这个名词的时候，其实。photo book 这个名词，过去在台湾就是我们或摄影出版物，我们通常把把它翻成摄影集。但在我印象中，应该就是我的印象中，应该就是呃，摄影之声开始把它译作摄影书之后，然后有很多的专题是以这个做专题之后，这个词就慢慢变得比较 popular， 然后比较普遍，比较常见。那我的理解，虽然这个名词，就我对于摄影集呃 collection of photographs。跟摄影书 （photo book） 这两个名词的差异的理解是，就是从呃过去的摄影师，那你问问他，就是他就过去的摄影师，他会打开书，然后指手指着书页上的影像，说这是我的作品，就指指的影像，说那是我的作品。简单的就说，换言之，书只是影像的载体。那这大概是摄影集的概念。但现在的创作者通常会把一本书视为作品。那不只是书上的影像，其实还包括图片的编辑、排版设计、印刷、装帧等专业工作者的参与跟讨论。那这当中当然蕴含着一种开放、共创、多重作者的概念。那这个比较是我现在理解的摄影集。那呃，接下来就是我很快的讲一下，就是我们来宝做过的一些计划。我挑了一些，然后想说快速的带大家浏览一下。那一些就是，首先是当代摄影跟影像交易推广计划，就是我们大概每年会办三十到三十五场的讲座，以及学校跟团体的参访。那里面有一些针对本土的年轻创作者的活动，像是 Photo Talks 当代摄影讨论会。那也有一些是针对摄影出版物，像 Photo Book Hour。那当然也有一些比较是专题讲座。那另外，我们也。接待各级学校跟一些团体的参访，让他们了解，带他们了解、认识呃摄影文化。就是我们简单的想法，就是你你是台湾人，你总要稍微知道一点台湾有哪些重要的摄影家、摄影作品、摄影展览、摄影活动、摄影刊物等等。那这是一个呃我们可以做到的事情。那另外，当然我们也做呃讲座跟呃那个参访之外，我们也做一些展览的策划。那就是我们去年参与的。呃，香港国际摄影节，那也我们用展览策划的方式，让台湾当代摄影的国际能见度也能够提升。那就是当时的一个作品放映会跟映后座谈，当时的呃展览的主题叫做“摄影变体”，它基本上是这些参与的作品，他们基本上都是静态影像，但变成流动影像 （moving image） 这两个之间。就是去探讨呃静态影像跟动态影像之间的关系，所以叫做摄影变体。那另外就是呃，除了上述的一些事情之外，其实我们也会办一些所谓的论坛。那在我们第一次的论坛是在2018年，当时当然就是发生了一个，就主要是为了回应日本社群所发生的这个所谓 Me Too 事件，就是摄影师荒木经惟跟模特啊 c o r e y 之间的争议。但我们其实不是为了要讨论谁是对的或谁是错，而是从这个事件出发，那我们怎么样提出一个台湾的观点？那所以我们当时特别在台北的当代艺术馆，那举办了一个大型的讨论坛。那我们邀请了四个艺术家，其中一个艺术家的作品刚好
在今天的 Alan 也也谈的是一个很好的艺术家叫苏慧宇，那另外就是一个 model 素人 model 游子跟妇女新知的董事，他也是律师林世芳，然后跟影像的学者非常熟悉日本的摄影。时的学者啊、呃，侯鹏辉。那从四个啊，当然还有现场的观众朋友，一起来面对这个困难的议题，那提出台湾的观点。那另外，在二零一九年的时候，我们也办了另外一场摄影的论坛了。那那个名字叫做《现实的挑战：影像档案、历史叙事跟记忆政治》。那呃，我们邀请了熟悉日本啊、呃、台湾、东南亚摄影史的研究者。那其中一位讲者佳琪。陈嘉琪也参与这次的讨研讨会。那接下来是跨域协作的计划。我们跨域协作的计划基本上就是跟不同的 NGO、MPO 合作，那看可以做一点什么事情。那我只讲一个，就是这是2019年我们做的一个所谓的呃联动强计划。呃，当时2019年反送中运动发生的时候，有很多的台湾人在联动强上表达了对香港反送中运动的各种的。声援或者是想法，那你可以看到各种的便利贴、文字、图画、海报，或者是呃标语、讽刺话，或者是影像创作。但呃，就是台湾的呃联动强比较特别的是，就是它不是一个自然发生然后自然结束的事情，就是台湾是你必须要申请一个地方，然后才可以去贴，然后时间到你把它取下来。但这个比较是。呃，特殊的地方，因为它会有结束的时间，所以我们它会自然的被消失，所以我们必须要把它记，我们觉得它有一个重要性，必须把它记录下来。所以，我们当时就是邀请了摄影家陈冰华，就是参与讨论，就是我们可以怎么样做这件事情。那另外，我们最后决定用一个拼接的方式，在这个连龙墙被撤下来之前啊、呃，完成一个很精细的全景照。我们希望保存下这个民主的记忆。那最后，在这个 Wikidata 朋友的帮助下，把这些影像档案上传到 Wikimedia Commons， 所以这些群众、这些台湾人的声音不会被消失，也不会被下架，而且是开放公众的下载和使用的。那后来，这个摄影家冰华他就把这个照片输出成大概十八公尺长的照片。那打开这个照片，基本上就像是一个 performance， 我觉得是一个很有趣的过程。那透支。我也有，我也觉得，唯有透过摄影，才有办法把这个东西有点去作者的在线，那让群众的声音能够呃非常精细的在线。那你用其他的媒介，绘画、呃、版画或者是录像，其实都没有办法那么啊、呃、精准的还原。我我觉得这是摄影很强大的部分，有时候是它的模糊，但有时候是它的啊、呃、exactness， 就是那个精精准。那这个东西，呃，这个连龙墙虽然是好像很静态，但很有很有趣的，呃，艺术家陈冰华也把它做输出，这有点像是一个 moving 连龙墙，就流动连龙墙，人们跟呃一群人呃拿着这张大型的照片，然后上运，上到街头去，让更多人看见，然后一种一种共在的感觉，我觉得是蛮有趣的。好，那。最后就是呃，关于呃 ，Livebox 未来的展望，就是呃，图重新重新想象摄影图书馆这件事情。那在展望未来，我觉得有两个非常重要的事情。我个人我个人的想法，第一个就是公共出借权 （Public Land Right）。那台湾其实应该是有可有可有可能成为亚洲第一个施行公共出借权的国家，因为我们已经在做，那我们应该会是第一个啊、呃、正式施行的这个国家。那这个样子进步的呃政策，我觉得我们很期待，也很倡议这项政策也能够扩及到译文出版物，那特别是像是摄影书或影像摄影小志 （photo zine） 的部分。那另外则是跟位在美国旧金山的 Internet Archive 所倡议的。呃，数位借阅控制 （Control Digital Lending） 这个机制有点关系，但由于这个 CDL 还是有一点点，还是不是有一点点，有蛮大的争议，跟许多的法律攻防正在发生。但就是我们密切的关关心这件事情，因为我们觉得那个 
public lending right 跟 control digital lending， 如果跟摄影的出版物结合，那将会带来一个非常激进交换，将会开启很激进交换的想象，就是你可以去想象那个 radical exchange， 不管是知识的或文化的，或者是各种方面的，我觉得会是一件。一个 plus， 但我们必须要确保在这过程中，所有参与者的权益是被保障的，这是一个重要的基础。就在公共的知识平权这件事情，以及作者的权益这件事情，如何达到一个平衡，我我我自己是蛮好奇。那另外就是在未来，呃，一定是一定会将会有越来越多的数位出版，但我的感觉是，实体书跟电子书其实应该是一个共生的关系。而不是电子书取代实体书，或者实体书比较比电子书好，而是这这这两者都有各自的价值。然后你阅读实体书的经验跟阅读电子书的经验其实是可以累加的，它不是一个互相抵消或取取代的概念。我我是用这样的方式来理解。那另外很多的实体书，它其实没有。呃，数位的足迹，也就是说，你在数位环境里面查找不到这件事情。那对于这些数位原生世代、数位原住民来说，如果你没有办法在网络上查找，它几乎等同于不存在。所以，数位化一些书、实体书，某种程度上有它的必要性。那另外，当然就是天灾、地震、火灾、水灾等等，你也会让如果它没有数位的版保存的版本，那实体书里面所记载的知识。或者是影像就有可能消失，所以它也有一个 moral imperative， 它有一个伦理的呃 drive 在后面，所以呃这两个是共生的。那另外，如果你一直出电子书，那哪天你被下架了、被审查了，你就是你你是完全找，或者是像香港的苹果苹果日报，就是整个公司关门之后，你是没有任何资料留下来的，那很多的记忆会不见。那所以。这两个应该是一个这样的共生关系。那我我这是我的个人的想法。那最后就是从 l i f e b o s 的经验有一点点小小的结语，就是我们我们的实践比较是希望能够从对于未来，我们我我的想象是比较是希望能够从开放、平权、跨域共创、跟虚实共生这样的视角去重新思考或想象摄影艺术与现实之间的关系跟可能性。好，我希望我没有让呃那个译者很很累，但就是谢谢各位的时间。All right, all right, I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you, thank you both. I I think I will speak in Chinese first, and I will um maybe ask my question and then. Also,、uh, talk my talk about my comments in Chinese first, so that、uh, our two speakers have some time to digest it before they respond. And I will、uh, follow that, and then I will translate my own questions into English, also to deviate to kind of、uh, alleviate the pro,、uh, the 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 load of、uh, the workload of our interpreter a little bit. Okay, so, 非常非常的荣幸有这个机会能够听到两位的。工作对两位的工作非常的敬佩，呃，我也非常的激动，听到啊、呃，您两位这个以公益为主旨，然后很辛苦，但是使命感也非常强烈的工作，嗯、呃，然后相比来说，我们作为象牙塔中。的学者感觉非常的汗颜，但是这里我也想呃毛遂自荐一下，有什么可以效劳的地方，也想非常希望能够啊、呃、成为两位工作中的一员。然后我首先啊、呃、就威仪的那个报告啊、呃、说两句，嗯、呃，原来我是几年前去台湾，然后当时有很多的。摄影界的同仁当时遇到了，当时没有没有机会，没有也没有这个荣幸啊、呃，跟跟威仪见面。但是有很多的摄影界的同仁向我推荐了啊、呃，您的《Voice of Photography》摄影之声。然后我就在书店里面到处找，也买了很多能够找到的那那那些期刊、呃，感觉非常的受启发啊、呃。然后。
刚刚看到您的报告中间啊、呃，写到您这个对于出版这这个刊物的初衷，就是基于一个对摄影的质疑，我觉得非常的受启发啊、呃。然后您提到嗯、呃，讲您考虑的一些问题是摄影。与我们或与台湾之间如何产生关联？我们如何介入摄影的意涵？如何，尤其如何产生对于摄影认识论的参与度和话语权？这这个问题的思考，所以我我就是很好奇的想问一下李老师，对于这些问题的思考，目前有一些什么样的心得？<笑>嗯、um, ，然后对于呃梁斌的呃 presentation 也是呃一六年，这是 Lightbox 是一六年开始的，对不对？啊、呃，那您讲到这个 library as method 这个概念非常的有趣，也非常的受启发。我想就是啊、呃，图书馆啊、呃，作为一个那个 built environment， 这这样一个呃。其实是 site of historiography， 就是一个历史学的这么样的一个场所。然后您在这方面的啊、呃、工作，让人啊非、呃、非常受启发。那我的具体的问题，其实啊、呃、比较简单一点啊、呃，具体的问题是想啊、呃，请问一下，就是前面昨天我们听到啊、呃、，NCPI 就是国家摄影文化中心。成立也是最最近几年成立，我想知道啊、呃，这您跟这个机构之间的关系互动啊、呃，好像您的这个 light box 社群参与或者是公共空间的这种感觉，也好像啊，不知道是中间有什么这样子的对话，就是跟啊新比较啊新进。啊，出现的这些关于摄影的这些啊文化机构之间的互动。I'll briefly translate it into English and give our speakers some time to respond.、Um, I'm personally very excited and impressed with the work.、Um, altruist,、uh, hard work、uh, to kind of. Think、public facing and thinking about、um, pop,、uh, the, the benefit, the public good.、Um, I'm very feel very embarrassed as a scholar <laughs> in, acad in in the academic world.、Um, uh, we uh, have a lot to learn from their work, and、uh, so my question for Wei Yi、um, is following up with his. Uh, uh, Comment his his question.、Uh, he 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 mentioned that it's kind of a, a recurring question that propels his work, which is how does photography relate to Taiwan, and how do how does the practice of Taiwan as、um, the place of Taiwan of、um, the photo photographic practice of Taiwan intervene into the epistemology of photography. Or even perhaps ontology of photography. And my question for Wei Yi is,、uh, what's his thoughts on this question so far、uh, today?、I'm、kind of sharing more insights on that. And my question for Liang Bing is one.、Uh, first, is my comment about、um, his wonderful idea about library as a method.、Uh, it's very refreshing and very、uh, inspiring. And、um, the library system as a site of historiography of photography, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, topic um, and also practice in his case. And my specific question for、uh, Liang Bing is about、uh, Lightbox as a cultural institution and also as a public space. And how how does it kind of dovetail with the, the other emerging?、Um, Photography culture institutions such as NCPI, which we heard from the wonderful uh, uh, presentation yesterday. How do they negotiate their specific space? As um, and um, how does an、uh, light box kind of reflect on its own kind of more nimble and more、uh, community-based, more interactive,、uh, and also more very. 
progressive kind of public space in light of uh, the context of all those wonderful things happening in Taiwan uh, photography. Thank you. Wei, you first. You you first. This is Liu Zhao. This is Liu Zhao's show. The welcome. I'm very happy to meet you. I'm very happy to meet you. Um, ah, regarding Liu Zhao's question, what is 那在这些年来，我反复的在想这个这个问题的答案。我不敢说我有绝对的，嗯，这个正确的回答，而是我在想象我们是不是刚好有这个机会，呃，对摄影在呃亚洲或者台湾的这些应用或者运用有一个反思性。因为我们并没有掌握这个摄影的机具的，在发明史上的这个机具的呃呃呃优先性。那我们的摄影，嗯、呃，是从被摄影呃以及对于摄影的应用开始。那、呃、我觉得这个这个关系反而可以更让我们可以脱离呃。在摄影的生产和消费过程中的这种，嗯嗯，设定，而应该可以反直觉的去思考，为什么我们是存在照片里面，而不是存在摄影机后面，类似像这样子的呃反思。所以我觉得我们可以运用我们的被动性，然后来产生主动性的思考。呃，或者举例来说，台湾有非常丰富的这个知名的历史和文化。那这样子听起来，好像我们是被宰制的一群。那这可能永远会成为某种呃，在影像历史中的宿命。可是我们要怎么样去质疑我们的宿命？可能要把这个部分反转过来，就是说。我们要运用我们这样子的历史背景，在影像上的被动性或者是后劲的状态，然后去想摄影跟我们的关系，然后利用这样子的呃历史文化背景，去重新描述摄影应该是什么，而摄影跟我们的关系是什么？那这个是。我也积极希望可以去探讨的部分，那我就不想要落入呃，摄影就是拍摄、消费、观看、视觉刺激这样子的呃现成的陷阱里面。我比较希望可以反思这个摄影本身它存在的样态，以及我们思考摄影本身的脉络。那这个是我觉得我在慢慢摸索的部分。我先回应到这边，谢谢。好，然后在在我回在我回复之前，我我突然想到，就是要就是，其实魏当时在讲说，他作为呃，他跟摄影的关系是有一点点，就是他会去总总会去提出一些质疑。我我觉得这个回答让我觉得很有趣，然后也让我想到，其实是在上一个 session， 呃，佳琪，呃，研究者陈佳琪在问呃钟文龙教授的时候，那。周龙教授就是 Alan 教授，他回的一个问题就是说，我的理解是，他在研究这些老照片的时候，这些物件，这些照片的物件的时候，他是想要 reconstruct 或 restore humanity 原性这件事情。这个其实让我很触动，很很 impressed。但我只是想要说出来。那另外就是。呃，至于我个人的话，我其实对摄影就是好奇了，就是当代为什么会做那么多跟当代摄影的关系，就是除了去思考，呃，就去想说，哎，那摄影是什么之外，其实我们我也我比较好奇的是，摄影正在变成什么？就它跟科技，它跟
新的数位、新的数位环境跟这个社群媒体的生态的时候，它正在变成什么事情？然后，或者是我们在怎么样，我们如何的被影影像化这样子？但 anyway， 他我我比较好奇的是这个。好，那我回答回答一下那个呃那个那个主持人提问，就是国家摄影中心跟 Live Box 的关系。I don't know， 就是我因为我工作的关系，我会跟。NCPI 的的工作同仁，呃，有有一些接触，那就是不认识的时候会觉得它是一个陌生的单位，然后不太确定彼此的关系。但是聊了之后，就是我们发现，其实我们都是在推进摄影文化的一一群人这样子。然后，那如果，呃，如果从从一个呃第三方，就如果你是一个呃对摄影的爱好爱好者的话。其实你就是可以把 NCPI 或 Lightbox 想象成为一个摄影学习资源的地方。那里 NCPI 有很多很多展览，然后他们的典藏有非常非常的多，那很有待大家去挖掘跟研究者的呃的研究。因为对我来讲了，就 NCPI 呃国家摄影文化中心，它很重要的一部分是拥拥有了这么多的典藏，抢救了那么多典藏之后。如何研究？就是我们如何研究这些老照片？那它跟我们的关系是什么？就是套一句最新的 V O P C H 的话，就是谁控制了？就是他扩了一一呃 nineteen eighty four 的一句话，就谁控制了过去，就控制了未来嘛。但我们不是要有国家摄影文化中心，我不觉得他还想要控制过去，而是我们如何找到一个方法，重新诠释，重新理解过去。从一点历史，就历史从来不是铁板一块，我国家说的算。就那个国家摄影中心，它当然有一个重要的任务，要提出一个所谓国家的论述。但那个国家的论述的核心应该是开放的，应该是为全民所共有，然后人人都可以找到一个诠释的方式。那呃，威仪跟那个摄影的关系是一种质疑，我觉得这是一个好的研究者应该有的态度。那这一个 quality， 那。周文龙教授他说，他希望在这样的老照片里面找找回一种人性，或者是呃重建一种人性。这对我来讲也是我从来没想过的事情，我很触动。那我自己只是一个单纯的好奇，就是哎，他正在变成什么样子，然后他会怎么样的影响我，以及我怎么理解这个世界。尤其当这些我面对的这我在大学面对的这些 digital native 这些数位原住民。他，我有一半的人生是来没有数位照片的，但他们是完全几乎没有经过那个 analog photography 这种类比底片的经验，大部分的认知是从数位影像、数位资讯环境里面。那我们的这个 gap 就是会越来越大。那我想说，有什么东西是我可以跟他们共享，或是为好奇他们如何被影像，或者是透过影像来建构自己或。跟跟现实的关系 ，I don't know. But anyway, 我我希望有回答到你的问题，但就是我先停在这里。啊，非常的精彩，谢谢谢谢。Jihi, how are we doing with time? I know. <laughs> well, well, um, we could have maybe by eight, ten, tenish. Like if we uh have question from、okay. the audience, and and I also have、right. question too, like. For me, like the voices of photography、uh, magazine itself is an archive, like very, very helpful resource for me and for scholars.、Yeah. Uh, like I have, like it's a special issue on the Cold War and photography magazine in Taiwan, and that's where I I could find、uh, rare images of Hanshang, the Echo magazine, and also.、Um, Even Lightbox、uh, Photo Library, because、uh, Liang Pin brought up the issue of、uh, library as method, but at the same time,、uh, I wonder like how you both Wei Yi and Liang Pin think of、uh, your project as an archival project, like even like for Liang Pin, like digital archive. Uh, for uh, Lightbox、uh, Photo Library or even digital library for your project. Thank you. Wei Wei, you want to start? 
喂，哦，你听得到吗 ？Yes, we could hear you. Yes. OK， 抱歉。<笑>呃，我我没有特别呃思考这个问题。虽然我呃曾经觉得。嗯，我们的访谈记录或者是一些书写，慢慢就会成为一个档案，然后我们收集档案也成为档案的档案。嗯，呃，我不确定那个里面可以有怎么样的关系，不过这都可能可以作为未来的参照，也可能留下一个我们怎么样思考档案这件事情的记录。我我简单先讲到这里，谢谢。好，呃，我这是有有趣的问题，因为如果你你问我，如果我的同事他是一个 librarian， 他是学图书资讯的，如果你跟他讲档案，他就会觉得那是两件事情，就是呃 archive 档案学跟图资学，他们有蛮多交集，然后他们会有点竞争，有点不高兴。那我是 library science， 我是学习 archive。他们有点不一样，但是因为我不是学这个，所以我就没有那个，<笑>不会觉得有什么 conflict of interest， 或者是觉得<笑>我会觉得就是他们的共同的地方，因为 like 呃那个图书的分类法 taxonomy 跟档案的分类方式是蛮不一样的。那如果我又坚持说，我又从美术馆的角度去想那个美术艺术作品的分类方法跟 archive 呃的方法的话。我们三个应该会就是吵架这样子，但会是很有建设性的批评跟跟跟呃讨论，就是我们该如何界定，就是摄影的身份，就是你你让我想到是摄影，它既可以作为艺术作品，它当然也是摄影师，当然有书，那另外它也是档案。然后我从这些不同国家的分类法，我一直觉得就是摄影就是很流动。然后你要用一种方法去分类它，知识去分类它的时候，它告诉你，它就是不断的逃逸在散落在不同的那个知识分类里面。然后各种不同的国家跟文化看待摄影的方式，或摄影在不同文化发展的方式又不太一样。那我觉得，如果你是一个学者，你很很相信分类法的话，那你会很辛苦。但如果你有时候可以抽身，就是分类法有它的极限，那呃，它可以帮助我们一定程度的掌握摄影的行动或摄影的发展的样态。但就是摄影告诉我的一件事，就是 like 就是 it's impossible， 但就是做那个过程有意义，你趋近它是有意义的。然后你可以了解不同国家的文化如何创造性的使用跟理解。那我我觉得是这样子吧。然后 archive 的话，我我当然就就是我希望我有资格成为我们我做事有资格资格成为 archive， 然后呃为其他人有有有贡献有价值这样。谢谢。啊、uh, ，We have a comment here from Meg. 啊、uh, ，Meg Jackson Fox. Meg, would you want to say it? 啊、uh, ，unmute yourself and. Yes, I was just going to say that the Center for Creative Photography. Actually, when we were founded in 1975, we were housed under the library system at the university, and then we eventually moved to research and development and innovation, which was research centered versus library centered, which is interesting. And only in 2019 were we then moved under the arts proper to be designated as an arts institution. But we are simultaneously, and what you were saying was resonating so closely with me that we are a museum, an archive, and a library. And we also have, ironically, a Voices of Photography project, but it's oral history. So I was so excited to or learn more about the magazine.、Um, But those kind of tensions and opportunities, as you mentioned, are really embedded in our institution as well. And I think that that that、uh, pattern, that kind of global pattern, is really interesting and kind of telling about the medium itself. Yeah, great.、Um, I guess we're kind of running down to the、um, to eight ten.、Um, <laughs> Maybe I want to follow up with a very brief comment、um, to Wei Yi's comment earlier about、uh, 被动性 I guess I will just speak Chinese and sorry,、uh, interpreters. Thank you for your hard work.、Um, 
呃，被动性的这个这个问题，我觉得非常的有意思。前面几年前有一本书啊、呃，非常的呃，产生很大的影响，叫做《Asia as Methods》。This is written by Chen Guanxin、um, as a historian. What I'm trying to say is that the the shifting focus of the field of both history studies and art history has kind of moved away from、um, An impact response kind of model to look at Asian art and Asian photography, especially,、um, meaning that we don't see it. We don't necessarily see see that model as the most productive. To see, you know, surrealism happened here in 1930s. Therefore, you know how Asia copied that, how, how Asia、um, responded to that. That model is not very productive, and also it's not necessarily.、Um, The the best picture of history either. So、um, the the the、um, recent scholarship, the move of scholarship is more to the direction of looking at modernism、uh, and modern art as processes.、Um, so it's not necessarily so so obsessed with the definition of what is surrealism, but more as the negotiation with certain ideas and circulation of certain image and iconography and how that's interacting with the local. So I think it, it really resonated with me when Wei Yi you talked about your 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 um your sort of um recurring question that propelled your work. Um. Do we have any other question or any maybe some response or <laughs> sorry to sneak that in last minute? <laughs> It, it's wonderful comment and and thank、uh, I really like thank、uh, both to both、uh, Wei Yi and Yang Ping for for your wonderful project and、uh, for attendees and for panelists you could always subscribe Voice of Photography magazine well they deliver. All the way to Arizona with a pretty thank you card. So,、uh, well, it's a promotion of the magazine itself. Super, super. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> super fascinating magazine.、Um, uh, thank you all、uh, to stay late、uh, in the United States and also by noon uh, on um, in in Taipei. So tomorrow we'll meet、uh, one hour earlier, four、uh, p.m. in Arizona. We don't we don't keep daylight saving, so there is no time difference between Arizona. And for those in west in the west coast, and two hour difference with、uh, central time and three hour difference on the east coast, and it should be. I'm very sorry. It is very early morning in Taipei tomorrow, seven a.m. But I really hope you、uh, hope to see you all guys tomorrow for the wonderful sessions、uh, on the on our final day of this symposium. Thank you so much, and have a good rest of the day、uh, in Asia, and have a good night in the United States. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.